This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome back in. We are back. Another One Blow Away podcast right here on Kansas City Sports Network. Jordan Foote and Josh Kaiser with you. Mr. Joel Penfield, he is not with us today. Um, he's doing okay. He, like He's still with us. Just not with us today to clarify. He's all in the earthly realm. <laughs> yeah, he, he's still living. He's still with us. Um, he just won't be back today. He'll be back for next week's podcast. Nothing um, long term at all. He's doing okay for all that are worried. Josh, how are you doing? Doing swell. I'm uh, very happy to be here and talk about the uh, eventual World Series winning Kansas City Royals. The above 500, regardless of the game we're recording right now, um, top of the sixth inning, they're tied 3-3 three to three against the Houston Astros. I keep saying it's bad, bad podcasting on my part. It really is like giving a live update for a game that's going to be over anyway, but um, to hell with it. You know, they're going to be above 500 either way, no matter what they're going to be having Kauffman Stadium as their home stadium. And that's kind of, I think, where we should start. And I believe it was you that made that point um, earlier on Tuesday in our group chat. So John Sherman's wife like went on a mini rant, I suppose, for those that are living under a rock or were living under a rock. Marna. Vote no. Marna, Marna, Marna. Yeah. <laughs> Vote no got the dub. Um, and I I don't even want to call it an upset because that kind of is like a a dick move, I guess, but it was at least a little bit of a shock to me. And it was like pretty convincing. Um, the Royals did not get their downtown baseball proposal voted for. And I'm just going to read the quote in full because I think that that's a fair and B will take probably 15 seconds. So Marna Sherman, who is the Royals owner's wife, um, unfortunately, neither team will work with Jackson County again. They had been working behind the scenes for two years attempting to get a location approved, which I think fr- was Frank White's plan all along. In any case, most unfortunate for, sp- for, uh, for sports fans in Kansas City, the lack of leadership has lost the city two treasured assets. I mean, if you don't support the Chiefs after three Super Bowl wins, why would they stay? We will be lucky if both teams wind up in Kansas. At least that's still in the area. Hmm. I'm going to let you take this one to kick off. Any immediate thoughts about that? Next time she's going to bring heat like that, I'm going to need my welder's helmet, just a just a warning, just so I don't get the blowback, the residual heat from the uh, the fire coming from Marta Sherman's comments on Facebook. But uh, it was very surprising. Um, it's not surprising in that the... Uh, I don't know what you want to call it. The type of person, the wealthy white lady on Facebook uh, has some takes. And uh, I do love that she's just like us, the type of type of situation. But it is very curious comment because usually in these types of negotiations, if they think that there is something down the road, usually no one says anything that has any kind of uh, conclusion to it. Nothing. They don't leave the door closed or they don't bang it shut or you don't the triple lock it and hit the deadbolt and get a stick to put in the side of it and then nail it shut like she did she really really closed it out and uh i mean that that was always the concern of everybody uh every sports fan in kansas city was always just always a concern to potentially lose um either the royals and or the chiefs to anywhere um even if it is kansas i think that's a huge loss for the state of missouri um mm-hmm. But some of the radio talk show hosts that I was listening to on the day after had it kind of hit us where on the head was uh, it was a very fumbled proposal by both the Royals and the Chiefs. I don't think anybody has any qualms with that. I think it was largely a campaign ran on confidence and uh, kind of feeling like they had it wrapped up regardless. You give us some pretty renderings and, and dummies like myself can get all excited and get get you run to the ballot box to vote yes for it. But there are people out there that did see some some voids in the proposal that had some credence and had some validity to it, and they did need to address that a little bit better and a little bit sooner in the process than they did. So it was fumbled from the get-go. The other, the other side of that coin is that the radio talk show host and John or Jason Anderson, A-10 on the, in the zone, kind of said it the best in that the only thing that really did was increase the likelihood that both teams would be gone out of Kansas City at some point. And that's not likely at this point. I think everybody kind of sees them still being in Kansas City in some capacity. 
but you could have voted yes and locked them in for yep. the foreseeable future for generations, literally. And instead, we in, we made it a non-zero possibility. And I think that is the big takeaway from from that perspective. But uh, the vote was the vote. It was a resounding no, um, even though it wasn't a surprise. I, I like you said, I I, I was a agreeing with you that it was a surprise no um for the amount of a no i should say so it is what it is i'm ready to put a bow on it i'm ready to kind of move forward here i'm anxious to see and i will stress the word anxious because i am anxious to see what happens from here for me the team so um, yep. we'll see yep uh two quick things off of what you said because i want to move forward as well um well, I guess one, because I forgot the other one, but they're probably related. Um, what is, so you said a non-zero chance of both sides leaving. Oh, the two things. The first one was I would have been interested to see what it looked like separately with the just the Royals. Now, still probably maybe would have been the same outcome, but like, I feel like a lot of people like the Chiefs proposal was just dumb. It was rushed. It was like, you know, very that arrogant has. proposal. Yes, exactly. Arrogant, very, is the right very word. arrogant proposal from the Chiefs, and I, I have no qualms saying that. Um, mm-hmm. Secondly, you mentioned non-zero. What do you think the likelihood or chance, for lack of a better term, would be of either or both teams actually leaving? Probably either team, because I doubt both of them would not yeah. be playing in Jackson County. I mean, Jackson County or the KC area. That that's a fair point. Okay, on the Missouri side, in any capacity whatsoever, I still think there is a forty five percent chance that the Royals stay on the Missouri side. I think there is a forty three percent chance that they go to the Kansas side, and a two percent okay. chance that they leave entirely. And I don't, I, I think two percent is about right because as a lot of people pointed out, that it's a lot harder and a lot less lucrative to move an MLB franchise. I think that that is correct, especially one that's kind of been associated with losing since 2016. Mm. So I think that's a little bit harder to sell to a team. But we've already seen the mayor of Dallas claiming that they, in Jerry World's backyard, could support the Chiefs. And they have a history with Texas. They have all this, you know, Mahomes is from Texas. and He's already, the campaign has already begun there. So I think that is a higher chance to move away from Kansas City and I don't think it's a good chance. I would still say it's still less than 10%, but it's, mm-hmm. again, frighteningly not not zero, especially on the Chiefs' side. And I don't like that you split those up because I do feel like that's what's going to happen. And that's yes. it's going to be a problem for the Royals and their downtown stadium aspect, their aspirations. Yep. Uh, ditto to everything. I, I think ditto. Like, I literally... I think the Royals are not moving. I do think that their prospect of staying on the Missouri side is good. Um, obviously if they figure out what they're going to do, then it makes it more likely the chiefs will do the same, but like the chiefs aren't going to relocate out of, and I can't, like you said, the KC area versus like moving across the state line. Okay. That's a little bit different, but still like a noteworthy type deal. Yeah. Um, I just don't think either of them will be like the, the Texas Royals or the Nashville Royals or the, the Dallas Chiefs or like none of that's going to happen. I don't think they leave the state entirely like meaning Kansas or Missouri, but um, they had a chance to extinguish that possibility completely mm-hmm. and they didn't do it. <laughs> now people are like speculating about what could happen. What, what area, if they did stay on the can- on the Missouri side out of all the areas that we've talked about, what do you think leads in odds Four. Where, what do you think the leader in the clubhouse is? Everyone being where they're at right now, or sorry, everyone getting what they want right now. The Chiefs getting their renovated thing with a better proposal, more thoughts, more PR for it. Maybe the Royals still moving downtown. I think that's what I would bet on right now. But like, yeah, you would ask me that a couple weeks ago to be like, oh, it's a shoe, and like, there's guaranteed. Now I'm like, well, if I flip a coin, that coin's going to land on its side somehow. And like not lead one way or another because I have no clue. Um, I still think that's what's going to happen, but I clearly do not know uh, what's going on at all. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. I, it's going to be hard for any Missouri location to overcome the Kansas temptation to legalize gambling, and we could be in a completely different realm on that front when we get down to when the lease kind of starts to come up a little bit closer. Uh, we could be Missouri gambling at that point. So uh, that that could maybe 
be the tipping point for Missouri is like they don't want to they don't want to leave the state. They want to stay in Missouri, and now they have all this new gambling legislation that they could tie to it. So um, it is kind of an interesting thought to to kind of think about that too down the road. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent with you. Um, actual baseball that we could talk about. A actual week of baseball, like not even a yeah. partial week, not an opening day, and then an abbreviated. You know, they add the day off after that, all that stuff. So recapping very quickly, and then we can go back and kind of pick out some performances. Um, Obviously, right now, on Tuesdays, we're recording bottom of the sixth. Now they're tied 3-3 against the Houston Astros. Um, On the third day, nobody out. Yes, so there's cooking there. Um, In that game, 4-3 walk-off loss to Baltimore on the third. It was kind of an embarrassing game kind of culminated with the bullpen and Will Smith not doing too well. Then a big ass win over the White Sox where they scored eight runs in the seventh inning, one ten to one, then a narrow victory, two to one over Chicago, a three oh victory over Chicago, and a five three win to complete the sweep. So there were a few players that like were recurringly good during the past week of Royals baseball. Um, Josh, before we go to the White Sox series, any overarching or, you know, individualized thoughts on Baltimore? Um, I, I We kind of went in there thinking it was going to be kind of a measuring stick to see where they were as a team. Baltimore is a very good team, and especially on the rise, and I just saw that they are calling up Jackson Holiday. So uh, I'm glad we didn't get them him on the first year round, but we will get them uh, in a week or so. So, um, But the Orioles are legitimately a good team. They could have come out of there with a three-game sweep against the Baltimore Orioles. And if we're using that as a measuring stick, we are one solid closer that we have confidence in away from sweeping them in Baltimore, which would have been huge. I mean, we would have been insufferable as Royals fans. We are already kind of obnoxious considering we are 6-4. and four. But uh, if we went, out of, went in Baltimore and took three games from them and then came back and did the White Sox as dirty as we did them, it would be... And we would probably start uh, absolutely chaotic, uh, you know, flipping cars and setting buses on fire <laughs> in the Kansas City streets at this point. So uh, it was a good measuring stick. I'm glad that there were three close games and three very winnable games. Probably should have won them. That was very fun to see. Yep. No, 100%. In that win, or sorry, the loss to Baltimore, the, the finale, Cole Reagans pitched six and a third. He struck out seven. He only walked two, gave up one hit. Um, he pitched a really good game. Um, as Joel's letting us know, Hunter Renfro got his fifth hit, which <laughs> technically does not count because we started recording. Yeah, very, very important for people yep. who bet the over on that to happen. But um, I do appreciate the sentiment for sure. Um, Michael Garcia, Bobby Witt Jr., Salvador Perez were combined seven for 14 in that finale against Baltimore. Played really well. Will Smith did did not play really well. Um, mm. but they bounced back in a big way and we kind of talked heading into the White Sox series of like, okay, you can't afford to lose games to good teams in an embarrassing fashion. Cause that proves you're not a good team, but something else that proves you're not a good team is if you don't beat down and beat up on the bad teams that are clearly terrible that you need to steal three out of four against and the Royals stole all four. They just mm. beat the living crap out of the Chicago White Sox, they made them look incompetent. The starting rotation continued to cook. The batters got going. Um, the Royals are not going to play the Chicago White Sox every week. Let's just get that out of the way. If they did, they might you know, push for triple-digit wins this season, which would be pretty interesting. But yeah, uh, be they did, yes, they did what they were supposed to do. And I think that like you can't give them too many props for doing that, but still... You have to recognize it's hard to beat any team, no matter what. And they did it four times in a row against a divisional opponent, against a team that it's early in the year they're fighting too. So I do think that at least means something. And you said it was hard to beat any old team. It's really hard to sweep a series, a three-game series. And it's very, very hard to sweep a four-game series. It doesn't matter who who the other team is. They're Major League Baseball players. Even if the Royals are a really, really good team, and this is all for real, that is still super hard to do. Um, I also kind of feel like I know what it was like to play the Royals for the last three seasons after having watched the 
stark contrast between just the Royals of 2024 and the White Sox of 2024. So it was a nice response. You have to beat bad teams, and then you can be in contention and, and play the good teams really, really well, which is what we've seen in the last week, which is very good. And considering it was like what we said, we talked about last week, it was a dick kick loss to lose to the Baltimore that last series to see them come out and respond with 10 runs over the White Sox and, and what a nine of them were in the eighth inning. But to respond that way and then to go on and win close games the three games after that and kind of potentially steal some of those games too was huge to see from the Royals. That was that was a responsive series sweep over a, a division rival that did not go unnoticed by the entire Major League Baseball. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, they played well. Seth Lugo had a good outing. Brady Singer looked pretty good. Michael Waka looked fantastic. Like that was a really, really good Michael Waka game that that I thought. Yes. Um, and then Alec Marsh just kind of didn't implode. <laughs> and sometimes yes. that's all you need. Like four and two thirds, he struck out. You know, uh, three guys. He gave up eight hits, but he only gave up three runs. You're like, okay, yep. you can do that. Um, the guy that um, was it, Joel, that had MJ Melendez as his person this week to chat about. As I'm looking through our doc here, um, no, it was you. It was me. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so we don't yeah, have to. We will talk about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we will be talking some MJ Melendez, but really, that's my standout from the series. Like he played yes. really well. He had an RBI on um, the fifth, which would have been Friday. I want to say if my my mm-hmm. dates are correct. Following day, two run homer built on the late lead. Following day, two RBIs along with Hunter Renfro drove in a couple. He's playing really good ball. We'll we'll expand on that here in a little bit, but that's easily my like overarching note from that series. Yes, MJ Melendez uh, might be really really good. Like not just like okay, he might be okay in the field, which is mm-hmm. way better than we kind of anticipated. Yeah, and he has a sixty. He's in the sixty ninth percentile of sprint speed. No big deal. That's uh, nice. That is very nice. Uh, and doing that all with the bat that he's doing, we're going to talk about later. It is very, very fun to see MJ Melendez turning uh, turning the corner here potentially and, and really doing a big. So uh, very good to see. Oh, and then he just got thrown out of home. So that was not great. Sick. Um, yep. He, for the most part, has been proving a certain somebody on this podcast that's talking right now pretty wrong to begin the year. So uh, massive props to him. And it's not Josh, by the way. Wow. Um, it's me. The Royals did make a couple transactions from the last time that we spoke, which is always fun to catch up on. They're not uh, ceiling or, or floor breakers for the org, but they are fun. So Connor Oliver was traded into the Pittsburgh Pirates for Colin Selby. Selby on the 40 man, but reporting to AAA 2018 draft pick career 349 ERA in the minor leagues. He strikes out almost 10 batters per nine, mid to high 90s fastball, got a slider and a curveball. Played at the big league level a little bit last year. It did not go well for him whatsoever. I find him intriguing. Like, I'm not like, okay, this 2018 draft pick is going to factor into the big league staff this year, but I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know crap about Connor Oliver really before that trade. So to get a guy that has a uh, the allure of like pre- contributing at the big league level, I think is interesting to, to say the least. Uh, I have no idea who Connor Oliver is. Um, yeah. Just kind of looking through this, he's a 17th round pick. Um, what year was that? 2020, that was last year. Okay, well, they, they must have really liked him because he didn't spend too much uh, time in the organization. But I am kind of intrigued by Selby. I He's got the strikeout numbers, but he does have the walk numbers, and I think that that is a profile that you can gamble on in the in the bullpen, especially in this um, so I'm curious to see what they do with it. I don't know if it'll make any waves, but this time last year we were talking about James MacArthur, not really uh, a big deal trade that they made and obviously has turned into a big deal. So uh, if anything, if nothing else, this organization has earned the benefit of the doubt when they make a trade like this, and uh, we'll just kind of have to keep, it, keep an eye on it. Yep, agreed on that. And then again, this one... Again, intriguing is the word, and and like not necessarily in like an inherently good way, but like I, I kind of raised my eyebrows at it a little bit. Um, Zach Davies signed to a minor league deal. So he's reporting obviously to AAA Omaha. Turned thirty one in February. I am, I don't even want to say torn because I think there's like a pretty clear divide with him 
career four three six ERA. He's been worth ten wins. You're like, oh, okay, as a starting pitcher, you know, I'll I'll take that. That's a, a good organizational depth thing. You look at 2022, 409 ERA and 27 starts, but like, man, since 2021, he's pitched some innings at the big league level, 364 of them. They've not been very good. 543 ERA, he's walking over four guys per night. He's given up almost one and a half home runs per nine. Like, it has not been easy going for him. It's been very tough sledding. I am not expecting anything out of this. I think that maybe if there's something left with him, "Quote unquote," only thirty-one. Um, that the Royals can still maybe save him, but like if there's an organization, no offense to them, that I would bet on figuring out what fixes a player, I, I wouldn't think that it's here in Kansas City personally. And I don't. Uh, I mean, it, it might be like a nostalgia thing, but to me, when I saw that, I was more like, I thought, I thought Omaha had quite a few starting pitchers that really needed the innings. And I mean, you got Daniel Lynch down there, you got Benes, Yano, Bolin. Uh, if depending on what they wanted to do with Seza, I mean, there's guys down there that you want to see start games and try to start to make some strides. So it was a very interesting, even if uh, it was a depth, you know, type of addition. Uh, it was interesting just for that fact. But um, he does have plenty of experience. It's a uh, you know, there's no risk involved in this whatsoever. They can see if they can do anything with him, and if not, they can kick him off and uh, say thanks for your time and, and bring up one of these guys that is potentially in Northwest Arkansas. So. Uh, if they just need some innings, that's what it kind of feel, felt like. But that was kind of the big surprise to me is that they needed innings in the first place. Yeah, it's uh, very early in the year to need innings. And yep. a guy like Josh Taylor, unfortunately for the Royals, is not going to be applying them to the big league club. Um, he's on the 60-day IL as we transition here into injury updates. Um, corresponding move for the Selby trade. Not a lot of thoughts there. Kind of what I expected. Um, he just has not been able to get and stay healthy and the vibes have never been terrific. So putting him there is kind of just par for the course. I think. Did they have a retroactive date on that? Mm, I don't think there was a retroactive date. I think he was transitioned from 15 to 60. I could be extremely wrong on that. And Annie's article I just read on Monday. So, um, I should have that memorized. So shame on me. Double check that. Yeah, she's got a really good article with uh, pretty recurring updates on guys like that, so there should be a pretty clear kind of distinction of, of when it was retro, if there was. Fangraph says it's a retro date of 325, so oh, his no. designation his designation would be 60 days from that day, so gotcha. if, I mean, he could still come back and uh, do rehab assignment for 30 days, so that could be coming at the on the heels of uh, later this month as soon as that, and activate them and ready to roll if they need some kind of contribution at the major league level from Josh Taylor at that point. They could do it at the end of May. Um, I don't know. I I kind of like Josh Taylor. He does have some solid strikeout numbers. There is some upside. I always want, you know, mm-hmm. I always want to have to be able to, or I always want to be able to build a case that they won any trade, especially one for <laughs> Adalberto Mondesi. So, um, I, I, I'm rooting for Josh Taylor. He cannot stay healthy. It just can't happen. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious to see if they can get him right, get him and get him contributing to at least Omaha. And if not that, uh, uh, see where we are with him at that point. But uh, yeah, hopefully he gets better soon and uh, we see him in Kansas City soon. Yep. Uh, another guy that very well could be in Kansas City within the month, I would probably say not necessarily yep. within a couple of weeks, um, Carlos Hernandez. And I kind of jumped over Michael Massey. We're going to talk about him here in a second. But another pitcher, um, he's progressing in his bullpens. He needs a rehab assignment. He needs to throw more. I just, man, I have no intel. I haven't heard necessarily what people have said. I've seen what people have written and reported. I know Carlos Hernandez's past six months or so. I just don't have great feelings and vibes about this. And if he progresses and gets back to the big league, bullpen fantastic and maybe he factors into the closer rotation maybe he factors into you know it can be a setup man something like that um it was a bumpy year for him last season the second half not nearly as good as the first i was thinking he needed a really healthy and productive offseason then a good spring training part of that happened part of that didn't clearly hurt now working his way back it could be nothing there have been no uh, bad reports, so to say, that like he had a setback or he's dealing with this, that, and the other. Just the progress seems a little bit slow. 
shoulders and elbows and any arm related injury are very tricky and you don't want to rush that. So not at all saying it's time to sound the alarms on that. Again, haven't heard anything bad. Just kind of interested to see how the rehab assignment goes, how quickly he hits the ground running, because I think it's going to be slower and I probably should have phrased it like that from the beginning, but um, don't expect to necessarily see him within a couple weeks. I'd say maybe early May, something like that. And Annie's article very well could uh, reflect that that kind of timeline. Yeah, my anytime you see a shutdown happen on a pitcher, I, I immediately start being like, well, that's two months easily. Um, and if, if that were the case, then they would have absolutely put him on the 60-day IL, and they still definitely can with that retroactive date still being a 325. But at the same time, like this bullpen would – would benefit greatly from his presence. I mean, we've talked about the the bullpen is good because it gives a lot of different looks and a lot of different stuff from a lot of different guys, and they don't have a flamethrower really in that bullpen. So Carlos Hernandez does have a role if he's able to get healthy, throw the ball, throw strikes, and do it convincingly enough to do it at the big league level and fool hitters with that heat. So there is absolutely a case that uh, he could be contributing to this bullpen really soon. He just needs to get healthy and, and progress. So it's good to see him throwing some bullpens, especially, I mean, I think he threw one Sunday. I think he's supposed to throw another on a Wednesday is what Annie was saying. So though that frequency together is a definitely a good sign. Yeah. And then Michael Massey being the final guy who's kind of working his way back here from an injury. Um, he started a rehab assignment. It was transferred from AA to AAA. He played on Tuesday. Cody and Gold had J.J. Piccolo, the Royals GM, on their show on Tuesday. He said that he's, quote, a little ways away with some soreness with stemming from the rehab assignment. Now, obviously not enough to keep him out of the lineup and keep him, you know, being shut down, but not necessarily right around the corner. And I think that we all kind of anticipated right around mid-May, early to mid-May would be kind of, or sorry, not May, uh, April. That's the month that we're currently in right now. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, Early to mid-April, sorry guys, that he could potentially be back. It seems like the Royals are going to give him the job upon his return. I don't necessarily have any qualms with that. I know that throughout the offseason, I've been um, very adamant that the Royals need to have someone to compete with him and give them the chance to take the job. No one that's played so far has been like, oh man, you can't give the job back to Mike Massey. I, I think when he gets healthy and back, he deserves it. And I do think that um, he is very clearly the quickest timeline to potentially get his way back in the lineup. I, I tend to think the same, but I think that might be just how we're used to it. I think that there, I do think that there is some credence and some validity to. Uh, the new motto being you got to earn that job. And I know Frazier hasn't been hitting the ball super well, but he is still getting on base. Nick Lofton's not hitting the ball really well, but he's still walking quite a bit. So they are both contributing to the team into the lineup when they are in the lineup. But uh, you got to be sure that when Massey comes back, he's going to do better than both of those guys. And um, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that that's going to be the case yet. I think he's got a higher uh, upside and ceiling than than those other two guys potentially, but uh, I think the motto of this season being you got to earn it in order to get it, uh, it will will definitely kind of play a part here. So we'll see. Yep, absolutely with you on that. We are going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and do some deep dives on players and a bunch of other stuff. You're listening to the One World Away podcast. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. Welcome back in. Jordan Foot, Josh Kaiser here. No Joe Penfield. He is going to be back. Joel will be back next uh, Tuesday, which means Wednesday for you guys. Extremely grateful for you guys tuning in. Extremely grateful for Emprise Bank for sponsoring the podcast. I should have let off with that. They do awesome stuff for us and help make this possible. So super grateful for them. Again, super grateful for you guys for tuning in and for Josh um, as he's jumping on and listening to me kind of flap about the Royals and we're going to flap some more because we got plenty to cover here. Flap a lot. Yep. Yes. We are going to keep flapping here. I want to hear your guys first. And Joel had two that I really wanted to listen to, but I think with us kind of picking 
a pitcher and a position player every week that we could probably afford to skip to and still kind of keep them in the rotation because they're eventually going to run out of guys anyway every month. But um, I am intrigued. You have MJ Melendez as your hitter, and I will not spoil who your pitcher is, but I definitely mm-hmm. want to hear what you think about MJ Melendez so far. He's very good at baseball. At least he has been very good at baseball. It's uh, It's been very refreshing. He's batting to an OPS of 1124, which is always a good time. Um, anything north of 800 at this point seems very, very fun for the Royals and, and their fans. So um, it, it doesn't seem like he's being cheated at it either. I, they're not cheap hits. They are a very hard hit. He basically rolled his success over from the second half of last season to spring training, and then he rolled that into somehow sustaining success in Kansas City. So it's very, very fun. He is third in the majors in barrier port plate appearance, which is awesome. Tenth best average exit velocity of 95 miles per hour. Crazy high. Um, unsustainably so, more than likely. But I, I wanted to kind of see if pitchers were attacking him at all differently than they had in the past, and they kind of are, but it, it is a small sample size, blink, 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 and drink. Um He's seeing balls in the zone about 45.7% of the time, which is down what usually you're around 49, 50% uh, most of the time in the majors. And the Royals are, as a whole, they have the lowest in zone uh, percent of the majors. So they are chasing a lot because a lot of pitchers are throwing them out of the zone. They know that this team is very aggressive. So um, they know they could do it. And MJ is not, uh, not any different from that. But he is taking those balls out of the zone, making good contact regardless of they're in the zone or out of the zone. He is a 93rd percentile expected Woba, 81st in expected batting average, 98th percentile in expected slug. We talked about the average exit velocity in the barrels, hard hit rates at 89 percentile. So this is legitimate from MJ Melendez, I believe. It is it's very good to see. It's what we needed to see. And he's, like I said, the glove has been better. He's right around league average in the metrics department on defense so that is also very good and his sprint speed is also up seemingly so uh, very good start to NJ Melendez he was essential coming into this uh, this season to to take off and really extend this lineup and right now he is absolutely on fire yeah no it was one of those things where if the Royals were going to hit their ceiling at all or even come close to it this year they needed a handful of guys to uh, step up, and it was Vinny Pasquantino, it was MJ Melendez, it was Michael Garcia, it's Michael Massey, and some of those guys haven't played yet. One of them is is on the downswing, but I believe will be on the upswing soon. We'll talk about him in a positive note. Um, MJ Melendez, Michael Garcia, both on fire coming out of the gate, and Melendez maybe even a slight step up from a Michael Garcia. He's been so freaking good yeah. just literally less than a month ago. It was like three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. I said he was most likely to underwhelm and fall short of expectations. Mm-hmm. And people thought he'd be a star level player. And I was like, I just don't see it. I think the defense is going to remain bad. I think the bat's going to be just good instead of great. Um, he's proven me wrong on both so far. So mm-hmm. I'm always willing to admit when I'm wrong. And I'm not you know, quite willing to admit it yet. But I think he is tracking to, to do that. And... A guy that came out of the gate and struggled immensely last year, then turned on the second half. Like if he can do this all year, and it was the same combo with Bobby Wood Jr. If he could parlay like the good part of his 2023 into almost all of 2024, and obviously in baseball it's usually never going to be consistent like that throughout a whole season. Um, but MJ Melendez, man, he's been super good. He's been producing at a high clip. Um, he's been super impressive for a team that. Obviously needs him to do that. Mm-hmm. Just like your guy. Yes. Okay. We'll go hitter, hitter. I like that a lot. Um, mm. I have Nelson Velasquez. I just don't know about him, man. And that's kind of my closing point. 30 plate appearances entering Tuesday. 173 WRC plus. He has a couple home runs. He's walking double digit times, but he struck out in the third of his plate appearances. 75th percentile or better base running run value expected Woba, expected slugging, average exit velocity, barrel rate, hard hit rate, sweet spot, bottom 10 and whiff and strikeout rate. So all that mm-hmm. to, to say, I looked at the numbers last year compared to this season. The barrels per plate appearance are far more frequent. The exit velo, the launch angle, the hard hit rate, pretty much of the same ballpark. 
Um, the line drive rate is up significantly. He's pulling the ball 13% more often than he was last year. The chase rate's similar. The contact rate's down. He's swinging way less in the zone. I don't know what to make of him. He's still doing a ton of damage on fastballs. He's not really doing jack shit against breaking pitches. Off-speed pitches, he hasn't done anything because he just hasn't seen a ton in the baseball, uh, not baseball reference, um, baseball savant database. He, the changes in directional hitting I'm intrigued by being more selective on good pitches with that is like a weird combination. So like, I don't know what to make of him still coming into the year. I didn't like the numbers look good. I'm perpetually waiting for the other shoe to drop with him. He is one of the most interesting players in baseball. I think because the raw power absolutely undeniable. He is so much fun when he's at his best, but like, I just, he can't keep getting away with this and he can, <laughs> Since he's been in a Royals uniform, and I don't know when that regression is going to hit. And obviously, from a 173 WRC plus, it's going to happen with him. But like, I don't know what degree it's going to hit with. Yeah i I want to call him like the new Salvi in that it's like the the seven foot center that shoots seven feet behind the three point arc. And you're like, no, and then it goes in. And you're like, great. Yes, <laughs> that's what Nelson Velasquez is like. He he doesn't swing at the bad pitches nearly as much as Salvador Perez does, but by God, he his swing is just so effortless. He is. We saw him in person person down there in Northwest Arkansas. It's just like it's wild. That dude is a brick shit house. Just yeah, six foot one two whatever of just pure muscle. So it is makes sense that he can hit the ball so damn hard so easily. But it always surprises me, and and I agree. Like what he's doing should not be sustainable, and he has taken the barrels per plate appearances is the only thing that's really taken a step back, and that's still very very good. It's like eleven percent. So it, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do with him. I just want it to keep happening. I just want him to be at least a little bit consistent. Where if he can be the power hitting designated hitter that can also play right field sometimes. That is valuable. We, we we were talking today about Edward Olivares, his hot start there in Pittsburgh. It, it was kind of the same guy. You just didn't know yeah. who you're, what you were going to get. Both of them can be very streaky and very valuable hitters. You don't know what you're going to get from defense as far as value goes, but it was it is at least good and encouraging that we trade a guy like Edward Olivares, knowing and betting on Nelson Velasquez being able to be a little bit consistent, and it is seems like he is able to do that. So. Very intriguing player. I don't, I, I'm like you. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to count on him moving forward, but it is fun while it's happening. 100%. Uh, I'm going to snake it here and take Angel Zerpa um, as my pitcher. He's pitched three and a third innings. He's struck out three. He's given up four hits, 75th percentile or better in breaking run value, chase percentage, and walk rate, 10th or worse in whiff, hard hit, and ground ball rate. So the fastball, I, I noticed two trends with him in terms of how his pitches are moving that I thought were interesting. Um, the four seamers getting thrown pretty much the same rate. It was last year. Opponents are thriving against it right now, predominantly still going against righties. Minus 1.9 inches of vertical movement compared to average compared to 2023. So I know that that sounds like a lot of you know deviations, but compared to the average, it's not getting nearly as much vertical movement. It's getting a shit ton, 2.3 inches more of horizontal movement compared to the average. And then his slider, um, it is getting 0.5 inches of vertical movement more compared to average, 0.8 compared to average um, last year. Both are like hot zones, like red hot in the Savant database. So I don't know, really, this could be small sample size. I know that we keep saying it, but it's true. He's getting less spin and more extension on the sinker, like very small differences in how his pitches are moving and how he's setting them up that I'm intrigued by. And I've always kind of been captivated by Anhel Zerpa and he's not going to be your number three starting guy. He's not going to be your number four starting guy. Probably he he was always going to be like that number five guy that could have weaseled his way into the rotation. Um, weaseling probably sounds like a, a, <laughs> a negative connotation. Like God, that damn Anhel Zerpa just yeah, somehow finds a way, but 
Um, yes. And, and working out of the bullpen, I think is good for him, um, especially right now. So again, trying not to make these like broad generalizations about any player at this point in the year, but I know Zerpa, I, I'm looking, uh, I'm going to keep checking the Savat page to see how those pitches are moving. And I think that um, they are worth keeping an eye on. What is his, I was going to look real quick, what's his uh, year-to-year velo change with the change of role? I mean, you would think that it played up mm-hmm. a little bit. The, v, the fastball velo is the same, 94.5 to 94.3, a huh. little bit little bit higher on the off-speed velocity, but everything so else not... is pretty much the same, which is interesting. Huh. Yeah, I didn't even bother to check that. That's a good point, though. That is interesting because they, I mean, it does seem like uh, Q is, you know, confident that he can come out and be a guy out of the bullpen, yeah. which, I mean, you just, he has always been, since his 40 man edition, has always been kind of a quagmire as to what the organization thought of him because he kind of came off the, uh, out of nowhere to be put on, protected from the rule five. And then he just kind of kept getting shots to make the, the big league roster that he just couldn't stay healthy. And he had some promising, you know, results in the major league uh, production, but, it just wasn't much to count on. So it was always interesting to see what the organization thought of Zerpa, and then even more so now that they kind of used moved him to the bullpen. So Q likes him in the bullpen. He's used him. He's not used him as a multi-inning guy, so he's not a mop-up guy, um, which was another thing that I was kind of wondering between him and Lyles and Sauer being the bullpen. Mm-hmm. It was like three guys that could do multiple innings, and you don't really want him to do more than that. So um, they are going to him. It is very interesting to kind of see how he's come along. But, uh, uh, but yeah, very interesting. Yeah. The the pitcher I wanted to talk about. And another guy that they have been using in an inter- interesting situations and kind of seeing the flow of the bullpen, who is the closer, who is the high leverage guys, where are they at, kind of falling into place, if they're going to be in traditional roles, if they're not. There is one guy that has kind of come to the forefront in a role that we were asked about in the preseason about the fireman. Who's going to be the fireman, the guy that's going to get you out of jam, so when you need a ground ball double play, who is a guy that you could bring in? One of the guys that has been very encouraging is John Schreiber. He's got a 60, what is it, a 60% ground ball rate or something like that, is like second yeah. uh, on the team, only to Brady Singer, who has an 80% ground ball rate. 80, 80% ground ball rate. That's bonkers. Bonkers town. So John Schreiber, not too shabby, 66.7, sold him a little bit short. So every two third of his batters, he's getting to run into a ground ball. So that is your fireman. And he's kind of been used as a fireman a couple of times in some high leverage situations. So um, he's had five appearances. Not many of them have been super high leverage, but there, there were a couple dominant, a couple okay, a couple very sloppy innings from John Schreiber. But you, again, always likes to make like, shake up what the hitters are able to see. John Schreiber does bring that to the table when he goes through the game. But I do think that he has become the fireman. Um, he surrendered a 188 batting average, but that is actually higher than expected. So that's encouraging. A 250 slug, also higher than expected. Also encouraging. His WOBA is in the 89th percentile. I should say, yeah, his, his expected WOBA. Sorry, his expected WOBA is in the 89th percentile. So there might be a dude in John Schreiber in that bullpen that could get you out of some jams later on in the year and uh, and really kind of help this team overachieve if they need to. The only thing I have to add is instead of fireman, I was going to say mop up, like clean up on aisle mm-hmm. four. We, the, the same, different roads to the same point. Like it seems to be a role that really is working for him right now. Um, and it's a tricky one. Like that's not yep. easy to come in and say, Hey man, you know, we still have a chance in this one. You need to keep us in it or, Hey, you know, stop the bleeding, whatever it's going to be. I'm watching it. And I've said that probably 50 times on this podcast. Yep. That's kind of where I'm at. Like with <laughs> it being 10, now 10 and a half, 11 games into the year is they're tied at three in the bottom of the seventh. Going I'm just keeping now. an eye on stuff. I'm monitoring. Uh, I'm, you know, vaguely corner of my eye, straight on looking like we're not going to make any season long projection or prediction or, you know, assertion about these guys. But the early season stuff is still worth keeping an eye on and monitoring and, uh, you know, following throughout the early parts of the season. And as April progresses, the bullpen's going to take shape. John Schreiber is obviously kind of settling into a role in a bullpen that may not have a ton of 
definition right now. And in spring training, we were wondering who's going to make it, first of all. Second of all, who's going to do what? We thought Will Smith was like Sharpie for the closer role. Then that hasn't worked out. Things have gotten shaken up a little bit. So I think it's all interesting. And the Royals are going to have some opportunities here to test that out. They will play Houston again on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, four games, sorry, three games against the Mets. Um, or no, it's four games against the Mets, right? No, they played Chicago again at the tail yep. end of that. Yeah, yeah. So before the next time that we talk to you guys or you hear from us, it's going to be Seth Lugo and Hunter Brown, Brady Singer and JP France, Michael Walker and Sean Manaya, a Royals legend, Alec Marsh and Julio Teheran, uh, Cole Reagans, Adrian Hauser, and Seth Lugo and Mike Soroka. So lots of good, intriguing pitching matchups there. Mm-hmm. I think that you aim to take, regardless of the outcome of this game, um, two from Houston. If you go one and two, whatever. The Royals really should be aiming to take two from everybody at this point if they're playing a three-game series, unless they're completely outmatched. And even then, you never go in or like, oh, man, let's uh, let's get one <laughs> for these yes. guys. Or like, let's just compete. Yeah. Like, the expectation should be, um, whether you're a media fan, team, the team obviously wants to win every game, but realistically they should feel like they belong. And I think that until proven otherwise, which again, a week from now, they could technically prove otherwise. But um, for now, I think these are all matchups that they could win. And now entering the game in a tie ball game in the eighth is John Schreiber. We know about the Royals spotlight curse. Let's see how that holds up. He's definitely in real time. Uh, just real quick about the Astros. Their record says more than seven. Um, I've seen a lot of people think that this could be a get right series for yep. uh, for them. I've also yes. seen a lot of people say that the Royals should take this pretty easily. The Houston Astros bats are first in expected batting average, second yeah. in expected slug, second to your Kansas City Royals. They're and they're pretty good. They're pretty good apparently. Uh, second in expected WOBA, but also the pitchers. Expected batting average are seventh. Their expected slug for the pitchers is their first. Their expected WOBA for uh, 303 is just fifth uh, fifth best expected WOBA. So this is still a very legit Houston Astros team that is just happens to be four and seven. So if mm-hmm. they can take two out of three from this team, that is very encouraging for what, what should be another uh, uh, measuring stick series. The Mets... They're still down, but they're still like hovering around in like a pesky, uh, a pesky way, and their pitching staff is still pretty good. So, what in previous years, if I, if we are encouraged as Royals fans, I would expect this same scenario to come up: the Astros kick us in the nuts twice, and then blow us out in that third game. We get swept. We go into a series against the team like the Mets, who are okay but not great, and then we lose one out of four from there, one out of three from them, and then you kind of come back like, okay, well, that was just a mirage. This is all, you know, time is a flat circle type of thing. So this is the kind of scenario that I've been looking for, see how the Royals respond. So far, they've passed the test of all the responses and uh, and rebounded from tough, tough losses. But uh, this is a good team no matter what you, uh, what you want to say. Yep. Uh, my bet for the last week hit. I had Salvador Perez under 0.5 home runs. I was fading Salvador Perez. He went four hits in 16 plate appearances. He had a double and a ribby, but no home run. I'm going Will Smith to not allow a single run under 0.5 allowed before the next episode. And again, Speaking as we are recording. Yes. Uh, his last two appearances, he's faced seven guys, two hits, one walk, two strikeouts, no earned runs allowed. I don't know how many times it's going to be used. I don't know what capacity he's going to be used, um, but I think he's not going to allow a single run, and it's going to allow some people to calm down a little bit regarding Will Smith. There are people that were blaming Q for not taking him out of the closer role soon enough when they hadn't even played double-digit games yet. I thought it was a little yep. bit weird. <laughs> um, so that that's my future bet, or current bet, I guess I could say, compared to... My last one, which for whatever reason was a W. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I also hit my bet, but I also still, uh, I didn't, my curse lived up and I won the bet, which I think that's about as good of a a win as you can get. Uh, I bet Brady Singer under five and a half Ks against the White Sox. He had four Ks, but still gave us a quality start with that 80% ground ball rate that is totally sustainable and is here to stay. 
um, very, very encouraging to see. But uh, this this week's bet, water is going to find its level. Okay, the Royals with started out the first ten games at eight quality starts, and the water is going to begin finding its level. It already did tonight with Cole Reagans not getting quality starts. Still kept them in the game, which is still very good. Like I said, the Astros are very good. So I think the water finds its level a little bit. I'm going to say under one and a half quality starts for the Royals. You can bet that however you want to. I still think they might get another one in there somewhere, but uh, it is a tough uh, a tough three-game series against the Astros, and then we'll see how it goes against the Mets. So still think that they could win every one of those games, and the uh, quality starts are still going to be fun to watch, but I still, I'm going to take the under as a water finding its level. Buddy, we have like actual minor league baseball to talk about. Yep. And again, no it's kind of like last week's episode. It. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like last week's episode where they had played a few games and we were just like, oh, well, you know, they played some games and let's talk about, you know, some of the stats and numbers from, you know, a three game series or whatever. But um, there are things to talk about. And damn it, if it takes 10 minutes for these teams, it takes 10 minutes for these teams. Um, Triple A Omaha entering Tuesday's play was three and three since the last recording. I believe they won, right? Because John Bolin had a really good game on Tuesday. Yeah, it was the uh, so, yep. Okay, was an so above five hundred. Bolin is a standout performer. He started on Tuesday, six innings, six hits, two earned. They were both solo home runs. Um, but he struck out ten. So mm-hmm. that was very positive to see from him, looking more like the pre-injury and surgery John Bolin the guy that could factor into the Royals future bullpen slash rotation plans of, I still would lean rotation. I don't think it's time to give up on that at all, especially after a day like today. Um, Really outside of that, CJ Alexander looked really good, but he's also striking out 35% of the time. He hasn't walked yet. It's typical CJ Alexander stuff. I mean that in the most polite way, Drew Waters and Nick Prado kind of, doing Drew Waters and Nick Prado stuff where I can't get a good read on him either way. And then Daniel Lynch had one more start where he threw five innings, six hits, two walks, two strikeouts, and gave up one home run. Again, speaking of guys that you can't get a clear read on, you can't really pick a side on, Daniel Lynch has done that twice in two games. Yep. I have not been super encouraged with Daniel Lynch, what he's done in Omaha, but I am encouraged and uh, timely, uh, considering the struggles of this Royals team, this major league team. The uh, Pennington, Sam Long, Luis Seza, and Stephen Cruz all had solid weeks to start the, uh, I guess not, they've got a couple uh, games already under their belt, sure. but had good weeks in the bullpen. So it's good to see options, potentially some depth down in Omaha that could potentially uh, could be added. To this, uh, to this Royals team, if something goes wrong, but uh, yeah, Walter Pennington, Sam Long, Luis Cesar, and Stephen Cruz all had solid weeks, and that's exactly what you want to see from them. Offensively, that's, just soft yeah, and yeah. real bad. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Thoughts on Double A, Josh? Any any immediate observations on what's going on down there? Uh, I think the standouts for me were Mason Barnett had a good uh, a good start, five and a third, two hits, one run, one earned run on one walk and eight strikeouts, which he came into the season pipelines, number one uh, uh, pitching prospect for the Royals organization. So it is nice to see him down in double a kind of, you know, getting off to a good start and, and kind of rolling with that. So he was the big one on the pitching side. Um, not a lot to choose from on the offensive side. Again, um, <laughs> Javier Boss drew some walks, which is encouraging because that's what he does. Gavin cross is back and, uh, he is hitting balls. They're not very. He's on hard. the field. Yeah. He is out there, which is the number one thing you wanted to see from him. But uh, Rodolfo Duran, mm-hmm. the catching prospect, had two home runs this week. So a uh, shout out to Rodolfo. He's just added to the uh, very vast cupboard of catching prospects that my this Royals you know team might might be able to have. So very encouraging from him. But other than that, not a lot to go on. I'm with you. I'll uh, I'll take high A to kick off. Carter Jensen, Carson Rockefeller, and Trevor Warner went a combined nine for 42 to begin the year with two walks and 13 strikeouts. So um, standing out for not necessarily the right reasons, and I couldn't cherry pick one player over the other. It was a pretty even distribution of ungoodness. Um, Adness, yep. Yeah, and, and Ben Kuderna, do you want to touch on his start that didn't leave a ton of promise and just kind of is what it is 
I mean, it was still three and two thirds, just two earned runs. So it wasn't a lot. Uh, no, it wasn't not, bad not per se. Yeah. Right. Not bad. It, I mean, it's kind of what you would expect from the first start of the season, which we need a reminder that that's the case. But, uh, I mean, not, not he's not losing stock for one start, especially not his first one. So, uh, Hank Williams had a good start, though. Mm-hmm. Five innings, uh, one hit, no earned runs, four walks, and three strikeouts. So, uh, it's nice to see him bounce back from a tough, uh, tough year there. But, um, he had a solid start, but I want to talk, I want to go back to that lineup because this, this quad C's lineup was probably the one I was most excited to watch. It had a lot of good Agreed. names there, a lot of big, uh, exciting players that should be coming out of that team. And, uh, that's one that I'm definitely going to be looking at. So to see them kind of struggle as much as they did this last week was, was kind of tough. So looking for a rebound from that squad, but, uh, uh, but yeah, that's all I got for that. Columbia, anything? Uh, a couple strong starts from Mauricio Valis and Felix Arande. Not a ton of idea about who those guys are. <laughs> 21, 20 year old international Chinese over the last five years or so. So it's good to see. We need takes, damn it. Yeah. We need Daniel Vasquez, strong week. Yeah. yeah. See Daniel Vasquez. Uh, we can see what happened. And here's the take Blake Mitchell can hit baseballs, guys. He can hit baseballs. Um, not a great week, but he can hit baseballs. He's not just going to sit up there and watch pitches, which is good. So that's uh, that's fun to see. Still walked. Uh, what did he walk? Once. Struck out six yeah. times, but uh, had a really hard hit double that was very impre- er, encouraging. So it was just good to see Blake Mitchell out there. Yeah, Vasquez, you mentioned him, 7 for 12. Didn't strike out a single time. He walked three times in the opening series. So um, they will have six games coming up against Myrtle Beach, including their home opener for the Fireflies. So lots of good stuff for them. Any final thoughts on minor leagues before we jump into our nugget of the week and get out of here? I'm updating my uh, my nerd spreadsheet, so hopefully I'll be able to release some of those uh, aggregated savants statistics at some point, but uh, still a work in progress trying to catch up. That's all I got. Nice. Good deal. Um, I'll let you take it if you want. I You have a fun observation that... Um, kind of aligns with the vibes lately online. Uh, basically, uh, it's just fun to see Royals Twitter in a good mood. Uh, it's a lot more fun when they're winning. Winning fixes everything. So, uh, I just love seeing Royals Twitter when everybody's vibe and everybody's got likes to give and retweets to throw and uh, just jokes to play. So, I, it's always more fun to see them over exaggerate to a positive degree as opposed to the sky is falling. Everybody should be fired. Um, the sky is falling type of thing. So that was my observation for the week. I'm happy Royals Twitter is in a happy mood and uh, it's good to see. Yeah. My final thought as it's the bottom of the eighth, so I don't know if we're going to be done recording before this game's over. I would guess that we are because you might only have a couple minutes left, but um, I was reading an article from, I'm 99.9% sure it was Pete Gradoff at the Kansas City Star and it was a really good article. Um, I'm going to say it was by Pete. I'm going to declare it was by him. And he had like a handful of stats that kind of jumped out from the beginning of the year, the Royals first 10 games. Um, I'm just going to list some of them and go check that out at the Kansas city star. Again, if you are intrigued by any of this, um, there are 14 home runs entering Tuesday ranked fourth at all of baseball projected to shatter the franchise record of 193 in a single season. The Royals have been slugging pretty well. Um, their whip for starting pitchers is First in all baseball, 0.81, not even at one. So they're pitching really well. No surprise in the rotation. They are first in defensive runs saved above average by like six. So the defense has just been absolutely fantastic. I I thought that we all agreed it could be good, but maybe not necessarily this good to start off. Maybe a little regression coming, maybe not. Um, And then the Royals, go ahead. I think Bobby has five of those. Yeah. Yeah, he's up there. And there's six ahead of Texas, I think, with 10. But, like, two players are... Like, the difference is still Wit, who either has five or six, and they'd be tied. So, like, they're still team yeah. defending well, but he's been absolutely, like, otherworldly so far. And right on time, he booted one at uh, last inning. Pretty routine ground ball, but uh, didn't hurt him in the end. But, yeah, right on time. Yeah. Anyways, love that. Um, And the Royals since last uh, July, July 28th, they're 23 and 14 at home at Kauffman Stadium. So that is a better mark than I thought. I remember they they finished last season a little bit better than they were starting it. Obviously, still not good overall. Um, but 
they're showing a little bit of promise at home. And I think that this season, if any of them or among any of them, makes a bunch of sense to do the same. So that's my thought. Again, really good article from Pete Gradhoff at the Kansas City Star. He has more data in there, but those are just kind of the uh, handful of nuggets that, that jumped out to me. Yeah, hopefully the starters especially can keep up this word. I have I have cause for concern. There's some some areas that I would like to see improved a little bit, but uh, it is a very fun start, especially for the starters. So as long as that keeps humming, this starter, the rotation is going to take them as far as they're going to go this season, I think. Yep. You need people to take you as far as you can go. Josh Kaiser is one of them on this One World Away podcast. You guys are a handful of them, the people listening and tuning in on YouTube, um, Apple, Spotify, however you are tuning into the podcast, Emprise Bank. Thank you so much for um, following us and sponsoring us and making this all possible. Guys, we will be back a week from today. Joel Penfield will be with us, barring anything crazy happening. We will be a three-man band again as we talk some more Kansas City Royals baseball. We'll see what happens in real time. So until then, take care, stay safe, and we'll talk to you next week.